at large bid here for Montclair State. Steven Bremen was named the co-NJAC Player of the Year. Justin Potts named the NJAC Coach of the Year, marking the first time the Red Hawks have had both the Player and Coach of the Year in the same season. Bremen, the 26th player in program history to notch 1,000 career points, also set the school three-point records in both single season and career made three balls. Welcome back to another episode of Inside the Nest. I'm Campbell Donovan. As you just saw, MSU is back at the big dance. After 20 long years, the wait is over. Coach Potts and his squad are back in the NCAA tournament. They will head down to Baltimore, Maryland to take on the Continentals of Hamilton College. Although the Red Hawks did lose to the Stockton Ospreys in the NJAC semifinals, and the Ospreys also did lose to the Roman Profs, who secured that armag bid, all three teams in the NJAC will go to the NCAA tournament. Let's see how they got there. The Red Hawks, Ospreys, and Profs will be representing the NJAC in three different corners of the bracket. In the top right, Stockton will be hosting and they will face LaRoche. In the bottom left of the bracket, Rowan will also get a hosting spot as they take on California Lutheran. And the Red Hawks will be in the top left of the bracket on the road at Dodds Hopkins taking on Hamilton on March 3rd at 3.30 p.m. How will that one shake out? We bring in Anthony Caffone and Brandon Moraza to give a little insight. We made it! John Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland. The Red Hawks are coming. The Red Hawks received an at-large bid the NCAA Division III Men's Basketball Tournament after a tough end in the NJAC tournament. And speaking of tournaments, I'm pretty sure Hamilton just won their conference tournament. Yeah, Hamilton won the New England Small College Athletic Conference Championship after a 16-9 finish in the regular season. They got hot, won three in a row, finished with 19-9 record to make it to the NCAA tournament. And speaking of being hot, Hank Morgan's been spearheading the way with 14 points a game for Hamilton, but Steve Bremen and the team has faced tougher competition this season. Yeah, Bremen, Mike Jackson have been scoring up top. It's been a whole collection of people. I mean, you thought about Francisco Paulino, Greg Eck, Kieran Flanagan, all these guys have made huge contributions to make it to this point. Well, tip off, March 3rd, this Friday. Be there or don't. Why'd you bring the balloons? We made it. We gotta celebrate. Right. Celebrate, come on. And Jack Gardner's are out, and our men's and women's basketball team scored big. Coach Potts won Coach of the Year, making the second coach in program history receiving honor. This season, his record is 22-4 and 15-3 and in the NJAC. Steve Reeman got Co-Player of the Year, making the second player in program history to earn Player of the Year honors. He set the single season record for three points at 81 and is the career leader in three pointers made. Mike Jackson got second team all NJAC. He finished the season with 50.6 points per game, 29 seals, and 71 three-pointers. Nikki Carter grabbed her third first-team all NJAC, receiving the honor for 2019-20, 2021-22, and now 2022-23 seasons. She led with 19.2 points per game, 3.1 assists, and two steals while knocking 48 three-pointers and grabbing 100 rebounds. Bremen and Megan Duffy were also named to the academic all-district team. From the hard court to the turf, let's check in that Sprague field. It may be the spring season, but here at Montclair State, that means that it's 31 degrees and snowing. The first two men's lacrosse games both went down to the wire. The Red Hawks went 1-1 one one in their opening week, coming out victorious over Vassar on Wednesday and a loss to Scranton on Saturday. All eyes were on Tyler McCreary as he took one step closer to become the all-time points leader, but there was another player who was all over the field. Jack Cleary put in three goals and had one assist this week. That was a, that was a great feeling. Uh, it's kind of hard to look at it right now after we're just losing, but like going back to it, it was a great feeling. Great feeling to score first goal of the year. Last only goal so far. Oh, now nah, it's two more today, but it's a good goal. Wednesday's game against Vassar was a tough one. The Red Hawks started out the first quarter tied with Vassar 1 1, but it wouldn't be long for the Brewers to take the lead. Montclair was down by two going into the third quarter, but thanks to Matt Dances, they went into the fourth tied 8 to 8. The fourth quarter was definitely a tough one for both teams but Vassar took the lead with 12 and a half minutes to go. The Red Hawks weren't going to stop though. Matthew Holland and Ryan Verbuchen tied up the game 10 to 10. With three minutes left to go, Cleary put in the game winning goal, getting the first W of the season 11 to 10. Last season, MSU lost to Vassar in the home opener. The win this time definitely gave the Red Hawks a lot of momentum. Uh, to get revenge against Vassar is like what we've dreamed of the entire year, the entire summer. We've wanted to beat this team. 
We know we could, and we just did it, so that's it. Saturday, Scranton came to town. Both teams put on a great performance with the score tied at the half. Montclair would take the lead in the third with goals coming from Liam Horton, Cleary, and Carter Finnan. At the start of the fourth, it was 8-6 Redhawks after an early Mike McCreary goal, his second on the day. An assist from brother Tyler who became the all-time leader in assists with 117 in his career. His next milestone, all-time points which he is 11 away. But then the Royals flipped the switch and put on a clutch offensive display. Two unanswered goals tied it at 9 and with 22 seconds left, Joe Boyle tied up, forcing overtime. It was a short stay and once again it was Boyle finding the back of the net, just 30 seconds into overtime. A tough loss, one that they will have to learn from. Yeah, I mean, obviously not a great feeling. Uh, you play 60 plus, you, you hold the team to, to 10, you want to win the game. Um, that's not the way that the dice rolled today. Uh, I think we gave a great team effort, but again, it has to be the entire length of the game. And I think at times we didn't play for the entire length of the game, myself included, and, and, and that's really what happened with the end result. Uh, I think if we play an entire game, dialed in mentally, physically, then we, we end up on top in that one. Um, but that's why we go back to the drawing board and we'll be fine. Let's take a look at how the women did on the road. The Red Hawks took a loss in their season opener against Stevens with a final score of 16-2. Chelsea Stack got MSU scoring started and Nora Monaghan would tally her first career goal. The team will be on the road again this Wednesday to face FDU Florham, but now that we've seen the season openers, let's get some clarity to both the men's and women's games. What's up guys, I'm Alex Boyce from Red Hawk Sports Network and today we're going to be going over the main differences between men's and women's lacrosse. We'll start off with the field. For men's lacrosse, the field is about 100 yards with 80 yards in between the goals and the women's lacrosse field is 120 yards with 100 yards in between both goals. The men's team have 10 players on the field, one goalie, three defenders, three midfielders, and three attackers. Whereas the women's team have 12 players on the field. They have one goalie, four defenders, three midfielders, and four attackers. When starting the game, the men's team start at center field with their sticks on the ground facing towards each other. The women's team have a draw at center field where they're standing with the ball in between both sticks. The ball is placed in between the upper thirds of the sticks during the draw. Now let's get into the finer details of the game. The stick lengths in men's lacrosse vary between longer defensive poles and shorter attack sticks, while in women's lacrosse, all players on the field have the same length stick. The pocket depths differ as well between men's and women's lacrosse. The women's players have a shallower stick pocket than the men's. This leads us to our next difference between the two sports which is contact versus collision. Men's lacrosse is a collision sport, allowing players to make bodily contact to hit each other with the sticks and take possession of the ball. Women's lacrosse is a contact sport with rules placed on how to stick check another player and how much bodily contact is allowed. And finally, I know that there's a lot of hype involved after this goal is scored, but in women's lacrosse, there's a post-goal procedure in which the referees have to ensure regulation for the women's pockets for their sticks. The men's team are not required to have their sticks checked unless provoked by referees or other coaches. And there you have it for the main differences between men's and women's lacrosse. The men's team is back home on March 5th versus McDaniel, while the women's get their first home game on March 11th versus Misericordia. For the first games this season, Montclair State met McDaniel College in the Ripken Experience in Aberdeen, Maryland, winning the first 25-3 and the second 22-5. The team made the three-hour trip down from their nest and started the season off strong. They had a combined 46 hits, 41 RBIs, and three home runs over the two games. Anytime you can get um, some of your new players some experience in the field, it's a, a benefit to them. Um, obviously, Matteo Pasculi with his first uh, college hit, uh, that was a cool thing. Matt Kaliski with his first hit for us in our program was a cool thing. And then obviously, I thought Joe Jasanda um, coming off the bench and hitting a, a pretty big home run there. Um, was an awesome moment for him. And the team wasn't alone in this outing. Plenty of family took the journey themselves to cheer on the Red Hawks. Seeing my son or our son play uh, sports, baseball in particular in college, is something that will carry with you for the rest of your life. And so we're fortunate, we're proud that Sam will always have these memories. Not only did the weekend include team success, but also individual milestones. 
catcher Anthony Guarino surpassed 100 career hits this weekend. It felt great. Um, honestly, going up to a bats, I forgot about it. Uh, going into the second at bat, I was like, oh shoot, I'm in 99, and Max bag got a hit, and it feels great. Also, first-year coach and former Red Hawk Joe Norton kicked off his year with an undefeated record. It's exciting to get get out and get right back into it, have uh, have some success early, and, and you know just play some good baseball. So it's exciting. Um, I'm just looking forward to keeping it going. Their third game of the season comes at Stevens on March 3rd. This Black History Month, we spotlight a man who is not only a leader but a mentor. He pushes his team to be the best they can be and he's the only black head coach here at Montclair State University, Coach Ian Carter. We explore the impact Coach Carter has had on his team. He makes me work hard, and that's what I like to do. I like to be active. When I would be, without him, I wouldn't have been active. I would have been like on the couch and just watching TV, doing anything, but what, what him giving us good, like hard workouts and like get us like a little bit motivation to get the, to get our competition going, I feel like I need that the most within, in the future, today, and like, later on too. He, he know what I can do and if I don't do it he makes sure I do it and I really uh, like that about him and um, he a great role model and he a great like mentor and like I really mess with that. I definitely feel like this school should definitely implement more black head coaches. As you see you see the succession he pushes us he, he does what he has to do to make us succeed so I definitely feel like Having more of that around the school would definitely be a benefit to not only the school, but the student athletes and the student body. So me being a fourth year, fourth year athlete now, uh, it's, it's having Carter, as Coach Carter be my, uh, my track and field coach throughout my entire career at Montclair State. It's been instrumental because he has been more of a older brother, I look up to him more as an older brother. The past few seasons I have struggled mental health things, I had a lot of uphill battles. You know, in 2020, I lost, I lost my mom, she passed away. And a lot of things, you know, just seeing how Coach Carter was able to be there in such a, such a dark time for me, I always just say, you know, do what's best for you, take, take care of you. It was very instrumental and it just showed, you know, he was more, he wanted the best for the person instead of the best for the athlete. Well, my experience of being the only uh, black head coach at the university has been, uh, Kind of a, you know, kind of a forefather feeling. It's definitely not ideal, but in the same breath, take it as a opportunity to showcase myself, showcase what black men and women can do. So, you know, I, I look forward to the challenge each and every day.